Hello, my name is Hugh Alexander and I work for the Curio Group. One arm of the group is involved with producing micromaltings and pilot scale malting systems. And because of this, we are lucky enough to have been asked to carry out the malting of these barley varieties, which were grown on La Brasse last year. I've been involved with malting and brewing since leaving university, too many years ago now, and I've seen all kinds of malting systems, right from the beautiful floors of crisp malt and warminster malt, to the latest Beulah Tower malting systems in places such as Montevideo in Uruguay. Most people don't know what malt is and the process involved in its production. To many, it's the sticky, gooey, yummy stuff force-fed, often with cod liver oil, when they were children. This is malt extract. When you visit a brewery or a distillery, malting may sometimes get a vague, slightly hushed voice mention of the M word, and not many people volunteer to go to a malting's tour. With the brewery or distillery, you know you'll get a beer or dram at the end of the tour. With the maltings, you might get a biscuit or a cup of tea. Malt is an essential commodity for brewing and distilling and other foodstuffs, and it sits between the farmer producing the barley or other grains and the brewery or distillery. Malting is on the same level of recognition as the barley breeders, we just work to make the whole industry tick. So, what is the difference between barley and malt? Barley is very hard. You can try and bite it, but it takes some considerable force to cut through the grain. You can mill it and make a flour from it, but it's not so nice as wheat flour, and it has this abrasive husk which is difficult to remove. If you mix it with water, you'll end up with a porridge. And crucially for brewing and distilling industries, this mixture will not ferment. Yeast cannot use this starchy mess to produce alcohol. The good thing about barley is that it can be stored for long periods of time, and some distilleries are still using 2016 harvest barleys as malt. If you look at malt, it is now soft and friable. It can be crushed and milled easily. If you mix it with warm water, the liquid is now very sweet and not like porridge at all. And most importantly, it will ferment. Yeast can use it to produce alcohol. You have to be more careful how you store it, because along with the yeast, a whole host of insects, birds and animals are hell-bent on, on getting at it. So how does this transformation come about? Because we're going to get the barley to sprout, it is essential that the grains will germinate, and to ensure this, the barley needs to have been kept cool and well ventilated to keep it alive. Don't forget, this is very much a living material. Dead barley cannot be malted. So, as a prerequisite to malting, germination tests are carried out on the barleys. If all is well, the first stage of the process is steeping. This is where the barley is soaked in water up to around 43 to 45% moisture level. In not too much detail, the region where the grain is connected to the plant is called the micropile, and because this is a broken area, Water gets in very fast here, and it is just behind the micropile that we find the barley embryo. So when the embryo gets to around 32% moisture, the rest of the grain may only be at 15% or so at this stage, it is triggered into its active state. Once awakened, the embryo needs food fast, just like any child. There's a limited supply of food actually in the embryo, but the bulk of the food is in the area behind the embryo, and this is where the magic happens. The embryo sends out hormones to a layer around the food reserves called the aluron, and these hormones stimulate the aluron to produce the necessary equipment to break down these food reserves. 
So this equipment, we call them enzymes, much like the enzymes in biological washing powder, which break down things like blood and gravy, begins to break down the food into simple sugars and small bits of protein. These are then sent back to feed the ravenous embryo, which is rapidly becoming a tiny plant with roots and a shoot. We are now at a stage in the process called germination, as with steeping, we need to keep an eye on the temperature. Somewhere between 12 and 18 centigrade is good. Because this is a living process, all this activity produces heat and needs oxygen. So, in germination, this is provided by blowing wet air through the grain bed. Because each grain is pushing out rootlets, if we don't stir things up, then these will all mat together. We can do this by hand with a malt shovel, or by running turner mixers through the grain bed, or by using a drum to hold the grain mass which we can rotate and so stop the rootlets matting. We do this for between four and six days, sometimes longer, sometimes shorter. It depends what type of malt we want to make. So we're now at a stage where we have loads of enzymes all breaking down the cell walls, the starches and the proteins in the food part of the grain. The grains have lost that hard steely nature now and are now quite soft. I have some green malt at four days germination for you to examine should you so wish. We need to stop this breakdown and the fastest way is to remove water from the grain as all these processes need water. And we do this by blowing warm, dry air through the grain bed. If we do this carefully, we will preserve all these enzymes, or well, most of them, because the brewer and the distiller need these enzymes for their bit of the process. When the grain is down to around 6 to 8 percent, we can step up the temperature without destroying these enzymes. Because when malt gets hotter, interesting things start to happen between the sugars and the small bits of protein. It's similar to making toffee or caramelising onions or a steak. We get those warm, sweet, malty flavours which we find so appealing. There's a downside to going hot, and that is we lose some enzymes, and so we lose a little fermentability. That is, we won't get quite the same amount of alcohol produced in a fermentation. So pale malts give high fermentabilities, dark malts more flavour but less alcohol. After kilning, we need to remove the rootlets, which by now are very fragile, and lucky, luckily for us, they break off very readily. If we don't get rid of the rootlets, they can give a vegetable flavour to the beers or whiskies. Not good. But the maltster will sell the rootlets as they are high in protein, and cattle and sheep love them. So to quickly summarise, the malting process is a way of one, producing a host of enzymes which the brewer and distiller can use in their mash tuns, two, breaking down the steely hard nature of the barley endosperm so that when the brewer or distiller crushes the now friable grains and mixes in hot water, all these enzymes can now act optimally and break down the rest of the starch into simple sugars for the yeast to use and turn into alcohol. There's a price to pay for the malting process, in that the grain mass has turned some sugars and protein bits into heat and rootlets. These are considered a waste product or a by-product, and so 1,000 kilos of barley will yield about 840 kilos of malt. The longer we germinate, the lower the yield, but the better the quality. The Rase barleys were yielding at 86% and gave 364 kilos of malt. Let's briefly look at what we can expect to find in a malting plant. I'm leaving out the screens and malt decalmers and just looking at the core process. There are a series of steep tanks. These are usually cylindrico-conical. Deep steep tanks are not favoured as the grain can generate a lot of heat during steeping. There's a method for extracting carbon dioxide 
usually air drawn downwards through the tank to assist in water removal as the grain is drained. There's a way of controlling the temperature of the steep water. There's often a way of introducing air as bubbles into the base of the tank to keep the oxygen levels up, a process known as rousing. And then a way of getting the grain out. This can be done either wet or dry and is known as wet casting or dry casting. In germination we see humidifying sprays to keep the air wet, a fan system to drive air through the grain bed and all of this connected with quite significant cooling equipment as the grain is producing a lot of heat in this process. To save energy the air coming off the bed can be recirculated to some degree back into the fan intake and in this way we can affect temperature control of the process. Kilning and germination look similar and sometimes the two vessels are combined into one. The malt kiln has a much bigger fan than the germinator and will use a considerable amount of energy to drive off the water from the grains. The heating system is usually an indirect method of heating and so a variety of fuels can be used for kilning. There is always a method to recirculate this heat as this can save large amounts of energy. Here we can see the approximate times for the core processes and this is for temperate latitude barleys. If we move south towards the equator we see that steeping times are shortened as these barleys are bred to tolerate water stress, that is lower rainfall levels than the temperate barleys. There is an Ethiopian grain called teff which is a desert grass and it will steep and germinate within two hours. It needs to respond to water that fast as rainfall in Ethiopia is so low and sporadic. Not a problem likely to be encountered here on Rase. So overall we are looking at a process time of around 8 to 12 days depending on the malt type. So with all this in mind we chose quite a long overall steep time with long air rests and a lowish temperature for the Rase barleys. Steeping and germination at 14 centigrade is a preferred method of ensuring high enzyme production needed for distilling malts. Germination was carried out for six days to give the barleys optimum conditions for full modification of the endosperm. We held off malting the barleys until May of this year because like many of the other barleys of the 2017 harvest, all three showed signs of water sensitivity. And this is where too much water during the steep actually inhibits germination. Allowing the barleys to mature is a way of getting over water sensitivity and long air rests also helps. We chose to carry out the malting in small 45 kilo batches in case something went wrong with the processing. It meant we would only lose a small bit of these precious grains. As it happened all went well and we, with no lost batches. All three barleys were sampled during the six days of germination and dried in a very small laboratory kiln. So we have a limited amount of these barleys as germination progressed. And if anyone has an interest to analyse these day samples, I'm happy to share some out, but supply is limited to around 200 grams in total for each day. Here then, we see just how bear went during germination. It showed vigorous growth and by day five was showing signs that it was approaching done. Similarly, Iskria, an Icelandic barley, malted vigorously. I have malted Iskria before now and this was barley from Iceland. I subsequent, subsequently brewed beer from the Icelandic Iskria malt and produced a very acceptable IPA. Sometimes you will see Iskria just called Kria. In my opinion, Canis was the best of the three barleys. I didn't photograph this barley during germination, but on day six I took this photo as it was loaded to the kiln. We can see beautiful cream-coloured rootlets, which are not too long and still showing signs of strength. 
All three were malted in our pilot drum malting system and for this barley to show this level of rootlet integrity after six days in a drum is remarkable. It looks more like a floor made malt where the turning is much more gentle. Here is a comparison of the three malts and I have these in the Petri dishes for anyone wanting to have another look. Big bold canas, smaller rounded iskria and longer grained bear. The six road bear showed this slight variation in grain shape. This is because six road barleys have one plump grain in the middle surrounded by two thinner grains either side. Two road barleys just have the plump middle grain, the two outer grains don't develop. This is the difference between six row and two row barleys and most malting barleys are two row. For the technophiles among us, I have included some of the analyses carried out on the final malts. I've included Concerto malt as a comparison. Concerto is the main malting barley grown in Scotland. For the 2017 harvest, it made up around 70% of the total spring barley harvest. The extract figures are in line with the comparisons from other sources and show how barley breeding has focused on this as the main indicator of malting quality. Viscosity is important as low viscosity tends to give a better wort separation in the brew house. And the mash filtration volume is another means of looking at how well the wort separates from the spent grains. I have included this graph as it again highlights an important parameter of the malts, namely how easily the malt grinds. It is an experimental method we have been investigating and one which shows good correlation with the beta-glucan content. Beta-glucan is one of the major components of the endosperm cell walls and its enzymatic removal during germination is considered another important marker in malting quality. For myself, I would rather see an exploitation of localness or provenance rather than highly technical malting specifications which were generated to suit a global uniformity. So I'm happy to see variation celebrated rather than stifled. I've shown here some of the kiln drying curves collected during this trial. It shows the typical drying patterns of a malt kiln and also the consistency achievable. It shows very well the difference in size between Iskria and the Canas, with the bigger grained Canas taking longer to dry than the Iskria. In relation to the kilning, we also peated the malt during production, specifically just before being kilned. When peat is burned, it releases as vapour a variety of phenolic compounds, and these are a key feature of the Hebridean whiskies. These phenols are absorbed by the malt husk and contribute to the nature of the final spirit. Because there is variation in phenols depending on how deep the peat is extracted, peating at this small scale is always going to be a hit and miss affair, but we hope there is enough of an influence to make a difference. Finally, thank you to R&B Distillers for including us in this trial. Thank you to the Rasse Farmers, Peter Martin and the James Hutton Institute for getting these barleys. Thank you too to the board of the Curio Group for allowing me to present these findings. And thank you to you for enduring this talk.